morning church so glad you tuned in to join us for worship today i encourage you to lean in let's worship him together when darkness tries to roll over my bones when sorrow comes to steal the joy i own Pain's all I know. No, I won't be shaken. I won't be shaken. My fear. 
here doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your in a season like this we stand in your love remembering that you're the cornerstone that you're the steady rock in the midst of the storm but I pray that you would speak that truth to each one of us this morning that we would believe in our hearts that you're still in control that we can stand on a love that descended to the earth lived a perfect life and even died on our behalf that great love we stand we stand
tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could he? could fathom such boundless grace. The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Oh, Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Yes, sing. That sealed the promise, your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Let's sing that again. Then came, then came the morning that sealed the promise. Began to breathe out of the silence, the roaring lion there the grave. There's no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. Patrick wrote this prayer many years ago. It's a prayer that just expresses a desire for God to be before us, to be behind us, to be on our right side, on our left side, when we rise up, when we lay down. And this next song is drawn from that prayer. It's a prayer that it says, Lord, we want you to be 
everything. We don't want to advance without you. We don't want to lag behind you. We want you to be all-consuming to us right now. So we're going to sing this song. It's just Christ be all around me. As I rise, strength of God, go before, lift me up, as I wait, eyes of God, look upon, be my side. As I wait, heart of God, satisfy and sustain. As I hear voice of God, lead me on, be my guide, oh be my guide. I go, hand of God, my defense by my side, as I rest, breath of God, fall upon, bring me
when peace like a river attended my way when sorrows like sea billows roll one Sing it out. It is well, imagine it. It is well all around the city with my soul. Let's all joining together singing. My soul, it is well. It is well with my soul. I want you to imagine that one more time. We're going to sing that again. Imagine it together. It is well. with our souls. It is well, it is well with our, with our souls. Yes, Lord, that's true. It's well with our souls because of all that you do and all that you've done, the comfort that you bring. So we lean on that. We lean on that. Well, good morning, South Fellowship. I, I'm Larry Boatwright. I'm one of the pastors here. And let me just say, I'm, I'm really grateful that you're joining us for Church Online. I know this is new. And kind of the world we live in right now with COVID-19 has been sort of a, well, it's a strange time for all of us. But you can rest assured that the elders of South Fellowship Church and the staff of South Fellowship Church, we love you. We're for you. We're here for you. And so, so today streaming for you is just one of the ways we want to serve you during this time. We've been dreaming of ways to step into this crisis. You know, historically, Christians in the midst of crisis, well, it's sometimes it's their finest hour. 
And, and we just really sense that Jesus is calling us to, to step in and to meet the needs of our community and to support our city and the global community as well. And so we want you to know that in the days and weeks to come, we're going to be releasing new information of ways that we're serving the vulnerable among us, including uh, food and supplies and other resources. There's an online guide to help you have a great time of worship and even communion in your church. And we're talking about other ways to build community in this season as we honor the governor's wishes and do our best to, to uh, put our faith over fear in this time. But church, it's an important time. And we believe that in times of, well, of trial, that innovation comes and, and actually does some pretty interesting things to care for people. And so be praying, be asking yourself, how can I, as a follower of Jesus, step into the gap in this season and care for people who need help, either by just listening to them or taking them food or getting groceries for them? We want to find ways to do that in this season. We are not running. We are not retreating. We're responding thoughtfully and we're stepping into what we sense God calling us to do for such a time as this. I hope you've enjoyed worshiping together. We're going to continue in our worship with a time that we call giving back to God. And, and yes, this is online, and so we're not going to pass the offering plate, but, but you can go to southfellowship.org slash give, and you can sign up for online giving, or you can go to the South Fellowship app, and you can sign up there uh, to give as well. Or if you're watching in our church in online environment, there's a give button right at the very top. And let me just tell you, about 55% of our giving comes from people mailing checks or through giving in person. And so as you might imagine, at a time like this, we could, we could uh, have some challenges with our income and our ability to do ministry, but we're committed to following Jesus and doing our best to continue to minister in a great way during this season. And so I encourage you, give online. If you don't give online, you can come to our office Monday through Thursday, 9 to 4.30, you can give in that way. And for all of us, Let's just use this as a moment as we, as we give back to God. Let's continue in this next song to pour out our hearts and worship, to acknowledge our trust to Jesus Christ, the one that we serve. You are loved. God bless you. Uh, Dan's going to come in just a few moments and give us a tremendous sermon. Um, so, so stay connected. Let's sing together as we give back to God. Oh, 
I'm glad you've uh, tuned in this morning. And, uh, you know, first of all, let's just admit right off the bat, this is kind of weird. Um, you know, I, I'm sure all of you in your living rooms or family rooms or wherever you're listening to this, maybe at Starbucks, you know, this is just a little bit different for you. It's different for all of us. It's different for me. Uh, if you could see this empty room I'm in right now, you could realize how awkward it is. And let me just say up front, I miss you all. And that's part of the thing about this that we're walking through right now. Uh, we live in some interesting times, don't we? Um, but you know what? It's, it's our community that we have to hold together strong, even when we can't see each other like we can't right now. Um, I'm glad that you've tuned in. Um, you know, the reason we're doing this, one, we want to protect you. We want to protect all of us, uh, especially those who are vulnerable or susceptible to what this virus may be. But thanks for understanding that. Two, uh, we don't want to live in fear. Uh, we want to live in faith. And so as we're walking through this, be asking those questions, how God would use you, uh, what he'd have us do as his hands and feet in a situation like this. And three, we want to be good citizens. Yeah, you heard Larry say that earlier. We want to be good citizens, and uh, boy, we want to get over this thing. So thank you so much for being part of this. Um, this message I'm going to be bringing this morning is from Mark chapter 11. And I want you to know, Yes, while we have changes like this, while there are changes to our everyday life, hey, let's keep on going. Let's not, uh, let's not stop and go away from this series. We, we've had a great series so far in this Gospel of Mark, and then what happened? And I'll tell you, this 11th chapter has some very interesting things in it. I'm calling it the, uh, the Great Reveal. Um, and, you know, I, I think of uh, how 
gender revealing is kind of a big thing these days. When I say gender reveal, understand, I'm talking about babies. I'm talking about when, when people have babies and they go through all these antics about revealing what the gender of their child's going to be, and it's oftentimes a big surprise. I remember when it used to be something as simple as just having a cookie that had some different colored M&Ms on it. If it was red, it was going to be a girl. Blue, it was going to be a guy. Um, and that kind of progressed up to donuts, you know, they have different colored jelly in the donuts. Uh, and then I loved it. I saw one, I was at one party where they had a cake. And when they cut into the cake, you could see the pudding and they would tell if it was a boy or a girl. Um, well, I think I, speaking of cake, I think I saw a gender reveal that takes the cake. Um, I, I went over to see Terry and Ann Bodie. And I would just tell you, uh, Ann just had some pretty significant knee surgery. And so I was over there saying hi to them. And Terry showed me a video of their nephew, David Bodie. David is a, a third baseman for the Chicago Cubs, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, this was one of the best gender reveals, and it just happened a couple weeks ago. Um, so I'd like to show it to you right now. Holy <laughs> smoke. Gender reveal. Wow. Sweet, do we think it's a boy or a girl? We think it's a boy. Boy? Okay. Yeah. And we need that same grand slam swing that you have. Okay. <laughs> I have to admit, that, that cracks me up as I see that, and it's, and it's special. Uh, but when we go through all these, these reveals, you know, we go to certain lengths. We do things out of character, um, uncharacteristic of us. And I think in, Matthew, in Mark chapter 11, we've got Jesus doing some very uncharacteristic things as he comes to what I'm going to call the great reveal. And I think there's three uncharacteristic, maybe even unpredictable things that he does here. I would like to uh, yeah, read, read the scripture this morning. I'm going to do it just like I normally do it. So settle back. In fact, I think I'm going to just take off my shoes and I'd ask each one of you to relax. And um, let's just go through the scripture in Mark chapter 11. And we'll be beginning at about verse 7. Here we go. Then they brought the colt to Jesus, and they threw their garments over it, and he sat on it. And many in the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and the others spread leafy branches that they'd cut in the fields. And Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, Hosanna, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord, blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David, Hosanna in the highest heaven. So Jesus came to Jerusalem, went into the temple. After looking around carefully at everything, he left because it was late in the afternoon. And then he returned to Bethany with the 12 disciples. And the next morning, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. He noticed a fig tree in full leaf a little way off. So he went over to see if he could find any figs. But there were only leaves because it was too early in the season for fruit. And Jesus said to the tree, may no one ever eat your fruit again. And the disciples heard him say it. When they arrived back in Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out the people, buying and selling animals for sacrifices. He knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves, and he, he stopped everyone from using the temple as a marketplace. And he said to them, the scriptures declare, my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you've turned it into a den of thieves. And when the leading priests and the teachers of religious law heard what Jesus had done, they began planning how to kill him. But they were afraid of him because the people were so amazed at his teaching. And that evening, Jesus and the disciples left the city. The next morning, as they passed by the fig tree he had cursed, the disciples noticed it had withered from the roots up. And Peter remembered what Jesus had said to the tree on the previous day, and he exclaimed, Look, Rabbi! The fig tree you cursed, it's withered, and it's died. Hey, before we dig into it, let's just have a word of prayer. You in your living rooms, me right here. Lord, thanks for this word. I pray you'd help us to make some sense out of it. And Jesus, thank you so much that you walked on this earth. Yeah, teach us now. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So as I, I look at this events that we just read. I see three 
uncharacteristic, uh, almost unpredictable events that occurred in Jesus' life when I compare it to the rest of his life and ministry. Um, he has this public spectacle, this public celebration about himself. And he hadn't really done that to this point. I, I would say, well, it's about time. Um, he had this kind of destructive miracle. Yeah, yeah, a destructive miracle. I don't know what to make out of that one. And then he had this public display uh, where he goes in, he makes a public scene, uh, uh, you know, flipping the tables in the temple. In fact, he really was kind of like a public nuisance. If, if he tried to do something like that today, um, he'd probably be, he would probably be arrested. So of those things, those three events, you know, we really know the, uh, the triumphal entry. We really know about him cleansing the temple. But that fig tree thing, that's a puzzler to me. So I want to just kind of start with that. Um, and, and you see how, you know, the next, the next morning, uh, Jesus comes with his disciples. And let me just set this. I'm not doing this in chronological order, as you can tell. I'm kind of taking that middle event where he curses this fig tree. Um, on Sunday, he'd come through and he had this triumphal entry. Um, and then the next morning, he gets up and he's going down. And I just picture him coming over the brow of Mount of Olives, coming down. And, um, and there's this fig tree. And he's hungry. And uh, it's in leaf. It looks like it has lots of fruit. He goes over to it, and he finds out it has no fruit. And then he says those interesting words, may no one ever eat your fruit again. Uh, and I, I kind of like that. He, he speaks to the tree. May no one ever eat your fruit again. You know, uh, just an aside, I remember one time when Carrie and I were, uh, we were at um, Home Depot, and we're walking through Home Depot uh, outside in the nursery, and we saw this guy, and it was like he was just arguing with himself and talking away about this tree. Uh, he was talking at a tree, and he was kind of mad. And Carrie just started singing, I talk to the trees, and they don't listen to me. Um, that's, that's the first thing I thought when I read this verse, and Jesus said to the tree. Um, that has nothing to do with this passage. But anyway, you kind of wonder, why did Jesus do this. This is uncharacteristic that he would curse one of his own creation. Um, maybe he was just hungry. It says he was hungry. And when he got there, he was kind of angry, kind of hangry, as we call it. Um, maybe, uh, maybe he realized the tree had lost its usefulness, so he just kind of said, okay, I'll put it out of its misery. Or, or maybe, and I think more so, he might have been having a living parable about this. Um, I still wrestle with it, and, and I had to figure out what, what in the world are these figs? Um, and I came across this uh, term, Breba fig, Breba fig. You can look it up on Google. It's amazing. You'll see lots of stuff about this. I'd never heard of this before, but basically a Breba fig is really the first fruit that comes out in the season, and it comes out before the season of figs even come. Um, you know, oftentimes a, a tree may kind of leaf out in June, um, and little figs begin developing mid-June to late June, and the harvest for figs usually takes place at the end of summer. This is time of Passover, which is in the spring. It's early, and Jesus sees this tree, and it's all in leaf. It looks like it's got lots of fruit. Breba figs are those figs that come out first fruits right around this time, and they're actually the fruit that's growing on what, what they call the old wood or the mature wood. It's not the new branches that are growing that are going to produce all the new harvest. It's the old ones from last season. And these are kind of figs that are left over and they continue to grow and they're really supposed to be very sweet, very good. Um, people after a long winter look forward to having these. Anyway, uh, Jesus sees this tree that looks like it's going to be fruitful, that looks like it's going to have Lots of figs to a breeb of figs, and he goes up and he finds there's none. And so he says, may no one ever eat from you again. Um, there's, a, there's a verse I just want to throw out to you to be thinking about. It's found in Micah chapter 7. How miserable I am. I feel like the fruit picker after the harvest who can find nothing to eat. Not a cluster of grapes or a single early fig can be found to satisfy my hunger. Uh, let me throw in the next verse. The godly people have all disappeared. Not one honest person is left on the earth. Um, I just throw that out to, to make you kind of think 
when Jesus went to this tree to find some early figs and there wasn't anything, but it looked like it was going to be fruitful and it wasn't. It looked like there would be some of that early first fruit on those mature branches and there wasn't anything. You put the pieces together while we go on um, because I just want to take us to that, that second event that I want us to look at, which is we all know as the triumphal entry. And uh, when I look at this, Jesus on Sunday comes into Jerusalem with his disciples and he orchestrates a celebration. He, uh, he instructs these two disciples to go ahead of them and to find a, a donkey. And then we, we know this story. He, he gets this donkey, there's garments that are put on top. He gets on the donkey and he comes down that hill, the Mount of Olives, into Jerusalem. And everybody cheers and everybody says, Hosanna. And we enact it many times on Palm Sunday. We love it. I, I love saying, singing those songs, Hosanna, and waving the palm branches and just having a good time like that. But I will tell you, this is pretty uncharacteristic of Jesus orchestrating a celebration about himself. And that's why I think this is a unique time in the ministry of Jesus. This is coming to that final week, and he's going to reveal something very important about himself. Um, the reason I say it's uncharacteristic, well, we can look through the Gospel of Mark, and it seems like time and time again, he's telling people to be quiet. He's telling people not to tell others about him. Um, in the very first chapter, uh, it says he, he cast out many demons, and get this, because the demons knew who he was, he did not allow them to speak. I would think that would be some pretty good PR uh, to have your enemy even point out that you were the Son of God, but uh, he didn't allow them to speak. Um, it tells us a little few verses later that the crowds were so great, they came to him and said, everyone's looking for you. And what did Jesus say? Okay, that means we got to go to another town. Um, everyone's looking for you. We'd, we'd want to stay there where all the crowds were, but Jesus said, no, it's time to go on then. Um, one time he healed a man of leprosy, sent him on his way. And isn't it interesting? It says with a stern warning, don't tell anyone about this. Don't spread the word. Um, another time when he's dealing with, with a demon, an, an evil spirit that says, you are the son of God. But Jesus sternly commanded that spirit not to reveal who he was. And then probably the one that I think takes the cake is uh, when he raises a little girl from the dead, and Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone what had happened. Well, this is a change. This is something unique, something uncharacteristic. Jesus is now revealing himself. And Jesus is, what I think, doing this great reveal. And he sends his two disciples in to find a donkey that he can sit on. He, uh, the, the crowds develop around him, and they all start start screaming and, and having a great time together. First of all, I just wanted to show you this picture. It, it does look a little bit like Sunday school, I realize. But I wanted to kind of focus in on this, this donkey and this picture. Um, it said, go in and find a donkey. You're, you're going to find a colt, a foal, which is really a, a young, young donkey, a small donkey. The reason I like this picture is it, it kind of looks awkward to me. It looks kind of awkward. I see Jesus sitting on this little donkey. His feet are maybe just a few inches off the ground. He's even a little askew on the donkey. Um, the folks who were here in Jerusalem at the time had been overrun by the Romans. These folks had seen the Romans enter at different times in ceremonies of celebration and victory, and the generals of the Romans never rode a white donkey. They always rode a white stallion. They always rode high and mighty. They always looked down on the people that they had conquered. Um, here comes Jesus. Here comes Jesus as a, as a king, but he's coming very humbly, very humbly. Um, I, I, I see in this Jesus entering, um, th there's some verses in Zechariah which really kind of speak to this. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey on a little donkey 
It's almost like Zachariah sees this picture before him of Jesus awkwardly coming in. A king, but coming in in kind of awkward humility. But as I look at this picture, I know this is Jesus. This is the Son of God who's coming in like this. This is the Son of God who has awesome majesty. Awesome majesty, and yet he's coming in an awkward humility. This is Jesus who has sovereignty. Sovereignty over all things. He created all things, and yet he's coming in hmm, in great submission. This is Jesus who has full authority and, and all power over all things. Jesus, the Son of God, and yet he's coming in in total dependence upon the Holy Spirit. What a juxtaposition when we come to, to worship Jesus. Um, I think John faced that same kind of juxtaposition when he looked at, in the book of Revelation and they said he, he, was, he was weeping and, and someone said, no, look for the lion, look for the lion. Look at these verses. But one of the 24 elders said to me, stop weeping, look to the lion of the tribe of Judah, the heir of David's throne has won the victory. He's worthy to open the scroll and his seven seals. Then I saw a lamb that looked as if it had been slaughtered. The lion, the lamb, the king, the donkey, the majesty, the humility. It's Jesus. He's, he's making a great reveal. And he's fitting totally into Zechariah's prophecy. But there's some other things. Um, Hosanna, the people were saying. Blessings to the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heavens. You know, at the time of um, Palm Sunday, I, I love this. At the time of Palm Sunday, we, we rave branches, we say Hosanna, um, and I've always just seen this as, a, as a, a great word of worship. Hosanna. It comes from Psalm 118. Uh, this is a great psalm. Um, it was my father-in-law's, one of my father-in-law's favorite verses come out of this psalm. It's, uh, uh, this is the day the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. Um, Carrie always tells me that he would say that at every breakfast, and um, she remembers very, very well how she would come into breakfast, he'd say, this is the day the Lord's made, and she'd go, oh, Dad, I'm so sleepy, um, but this is the day the Lord has made. Let's look at these verses. This is the day the Lord's made. We'll rejoice and be glad in it. Please, Lord, please save us. Please, Lord, please give us success. Bless the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. Do you see the word Hosanna in there? Well, I'll tell you it is. It's translated here, please, Lord, please save us. There's a desperation. There's a hope. The people are proclaiming he's the Messiah. But it's not that kind of victorious worship that we do on Palm Sunday. It's kind of saying, Lord, we need you. I wonder sometimes if I have that same kind of desperation in my worship. Um, you know, when I told you all those things about Jesus uh, holding back the crowds from proclaiming who he was or from pushing him too quickly. Four days from now, Jesus is going to be talking with his father and he's going to be saying, Father, the time is now. The hour has come. And I believe very much that Jesus is making the great reveal that he is the Messiah. Um, as, as Jesus comes into Jerusalem in this victorious parade with these palm branches waving, um, it has a very interesting little verse that's added here. And basically it just says, it says, So Jesus came to Jerusalem and went into the temple, and after looking around carefully at everything, he left, because it was late in the afternoon. This is the time of Passover. I just want to give you a little bit of background about maybe what Jesus was observing when he uh, got off that little donkey and walked into the temple courts. Um, let me show you a, a little diagram of the temple. This is of Herod's temple, and Herod would have been the king at that time, and it took Herod about 40 years to construct this edifice called the temple. Um, as you look at this, this is really 
the basic temple area. You come through here. This is the court of women. This is where the Israelite women could go in. Then you come back here, the court of Israelites. That's where the men could go in. That's where the altar was, where sacrifices were made. Then you come to this tall structure, which is really the holy place. That's only where the priests could go in. But look at all this around here. This is called the court of Gentiles. The court of the Gentiles or the court of the nations. Josephus, who was a Jewish historian, tells us that um, on Passover, many times, the uh, population of Jerusalem would multiply to almost 2 million people. 2 million people. That's a lot of people. Uh, I, wondered, I wonder what Jerusalem's population is. So I looked it up. In the time of Jesus, the population of Jerusalem was about 40,000. Can you imagine how many people came crowding in. Um, and for Passover, these courts would have been filled with all kinds of people. Um, they, they were preparing and offering and, and getting ready to offer sacrifices. Every family that came had to offer a lamb or a dove um, to cover their, their sins. And uh, so they would come and they would bring their sacrifice with them. Their sacrifice had to be blameless, couldn't have any kind of marks on it. And um, so what developed over the years was that the priests would have to uh, examine each sacrifice that was brought. And many of those sacrifices didn't pass the mustard, so they'd have to have other sacrifices for them. And the priests themselves actually had flocks of sheep that were available if they wanted to buy uh, a lamb to be able to offer as a sacrifice. Um, many times on Passover, these courts were filled with stalls of animals. And the animal keepers would be there, the shepherds who, uh, uh, you know, not surprisingly, many of these sheep were raised in Bethlehem. But they would come up here to Jerusalem about five miles away, and they would have these sacrifices available at Passover. Um, the, per the pilgrim that was coming in would be faced kind of with a dilemma. They'd have to buy a lamb if, if theirs was not acceptable. So they'd have to buy a lamb that was from the priests, and uh, many times... Those prices were four, five, six times more than what a lamb normally cost. Um, they'd have to produce the money, and then, and then they faced another dilemma. Most of the time, the money was in Roman currency. That wasn't acceptable in the temple of, of the Jews. They had to use Jewish currency, so they had to exchange it. So you had tables that were money exchangers, um, and uh, they would exchange it at exorbitant rates. So the pilgrim got taken both ways, exchanging money so it was usable, buying animals that cost a lot of money. And these courts were filled because Josephus said one Passover, the estimate the priests gave him was that there was 250,000 lambs sacrificed. If you can imagine all that cacophony going on in those courts... Someone um, used the term and said, it, it's basically, if you think about Wall Street, if you think about our, our financial floors and how chaotic and confusing those seem, and then you add hundreds of animals to it, um, you kind of get an idea of what the temple might be like. In fact, it would be thousands and thousands of animals. It says Jesus looked at everything. Jesus looked at everything. I never really spent some time thinking about that. Except I was reading Tim Keller, and he kind of stimulated my thinking to ask the question, what is the purpose of the temple, and, and what might Jesus be observing as he's looking at all these things taking place in the temple courts? And to tell you the truth, I think he's thinking back to that first temple. And no, that's not Solomon's temple. Yes, that was the first one that mankind built, but there was a temple before that. Um, I believe the first temple was really the Garden of Eden, where God, man and woman, had a unity together that, oh, we long to have. And that's what the purpose of the temple is supposed to be, where we connect with God, where we come together with God. Um, Tim Keller puts it this way, the story of the temple starts all the way back in the Garden of Eden, that primal garden was a sanctuary. It was a place where the presence of God dwelled. It was a paradise. And in the presence of God, there's shalom. Absolute, flourishing, fulfillment, joy, and bliss. I kind of picture Jesus walking through there thinking back, boy, what we had for these people. What the Father 
what the Spirit and I had to offer you, the people, and what you threw away. I wonder what might be going through his mind. Um, In Genesis, as I go back there, I read these words. After Adam and Eve chose a different way and chose not to go in God's way and not to walk in this unity with God, God had to banish them from the garden. And it says, uh, The Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. And after he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth and guarding the way to the tree of life. Um, there's an artist's rendition of that angel. Um, yeah, we always kind of fall short. I don't see the flames coming out of that sword, but that'd be the matter. I'm, I'm sure Jesus is looking at that sword. I'm sure Jesus is remembering how precious it was to walk with his creation. And now he's seeing this temple and how sad he is to see where it's come. Um, I just want to challenge us with a very simple thought, just a simple thought. Remember, the gospel begins in Genesis 1 and 2. It does not begin in Genesis 3 where we failed. It begins with God's great picture and purpose for us as his creation. He so much wants to have that unity and that oneness. And here's Jesus. Here's Jesus walking in that temple and seeing what is what has transpired, what we've come up with as far as what a temple should be. And Jesus is remembering back to that original temple, that first temple. Well, let me move on then to the third event. We've kind of looked at this destructive miracle of the fig tree. Interesting. We've looked at this triumphal entry of coming in and, and, and people proclaiming him with Hosanna and him fulfilling these messianic prophecies, riding a donkey, a pole, um, and then going in and taking a look at the garden, taking a look at the temple and uh, rem- reminiscing about the garden. And now, now we come to what many of us know as the cleansing of the temple. And let me again set the chronology, because we kind of mixed it up a little bit. It starts with coming down the triumphal entry, then he takes a look at this temple. Then the next morning, um, gets up, he's hungry, the fig tree doesn't produce any fruit, uh, that those mature branches don't bring the first fruits he's looking for, and so he curses it. And then he goes into Jerusalem, and this is what happens. The next, when they arrived back in Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple and he began to drive out the people buying and selling animals for sacrifices. He knocked over the tables of the money changers, the chairs of those selling doves, and he stopped everyone from using the temple as a marketplace. We see Jesus cleansing the temple. Um, We see his anger coming out. Um, You know, all of these money changers tables he's overturning all of these animal stalls he's cleaning out Uh, john's gospel even tells us that he makes a whip and he drives the animals out of those courts of the gentiles out of those courts of the nations and then jesus says these words he said to them the scriptures declare my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations but you've turned it into a den of thieves a house of prayer for all nations, but you've turned it into a den of thieves. You know, it's so easy for me to read that and not let it sink in. As I was working on this passage, it, it kind of hit me. In fact, I've always looked at it as saying, my temple is a place of prayer. And, and we're going to come together and we're going to pray for all nations. That's the way I always interpreted this passage. I actually went to Carrie, and I said, Hun, is, is that the way you looked at these verses, uh, that the temple is a place of prayer and we're supposed to pray for all nations? And Carrie said, well, no. It says it's a place for all nations to be able to pray. And you know what? That's true. Um, th- this huge court that was in the temple 
grounds that was called the court of all nations or the court of the Gentiles was made for the Gentiles to be able to come and to pray and converse with God somewhere along the lines. You know, it, this challenged me because I kind of wondered, man, is there some racism in my bones? And yeah, I guess there is. I kind of have this we-they mentality. I kind of see the temple as for me to be able to pray for everybody else instead of realizing, no, the temple's for everybody else to get together with me and we commune with God. The temple is not supposed to have anything hindering all of this world coming together. I'd have to admit, for me, yeah, I want that temple to open up to what God's purpose would be. I, I bring out just another simple little point. Remember, the temple is where we connect with God and with all His people. I'm sad when I think about Sunday mornings because I think uh, someone said at one time that Sunday morning is one of the most segregated hours of the week. We kind of worship God with people we like like us instead of coming together with the world before God. I'm, I'm challenged. As, as I think of that temple, and I think of what the mess was that Jesus saw, and how he cleaned it up, and how he overturned those, t- those tables, and you know, it wasn't 40 years later that that temple was destroyed, but Jesus did an amazing, powerful work, and it's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Don't you realize that you yourselves are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you? We are the temple. We are God's place. We are the temple of God. God's going to destroy anyone who destroys this temple for God's temple's holy. And you're that temple. That's a challenge to me, folks, because I realize I'm supposed to be a welcoming person to to people who are very different than I am. You know, at this point, if, um, if we hadn't had all this stuff with coronavirus, I'd probably be making this, this shameless plug for a seminar we were supposed to have tonight called um, Fear, Facts, and Faith on, on the whole immigrant and refugee situation. Uh, we're not going to be able to have that tonight, but we're going to try to have it again sometime. We're just postponing it until we get through this time in, in, our, in our lives. Um, but I need to hear that. And I hope you realize you probably do too. Somehow we have to ask ourselves, how do we really make our home? How do we make South that welcoming place for people that are different than us? How do we make ourselves, our hearts, welcoming for people who are different than us? How do we make room for others? Not just for where we're comfortable, but maybe where the rubber meets the road, where it gets a little uncomfortable. I leave that with you. Think about it. You know, we're coming to the end. We're coming to the end, and um, uh, Jesus, after overturning those tables, he goes back out to Bethany. And the next morning, they get up, the disciples, and they, he and his disciples start coming back toward Jerusalem, and we read these verses. The next morning, as they passed by the fig tree he had cursed, the disciples noticed it had withered from the roots up, and Peter remembered what Jesus had said to the tree on the previous day, and he exclaimed, Look, Rabbi, the fig tree you cursed, it's, it's withered. It's withered, and it's died. And I kind of picture the disciples and Jesus coming down the Mount of Olives toward Jerusalem, and here's this dead fig tree now. And Peter brings this up, and he's amazed, and I, and I kind of go back to a verse I shared a verse in Micah before, but let me share a verse in Hosea. A verse in Hosea. The Lord says, O Israel, when I first found you, it was like finding fresh grapes in the desert. When I saw your ancestors, it was like seeing the first ripe figs of the season. But then they deserted me for Baal Peor, giving themselves to that shameful idol. Soon they became vile, as vile as the God they worshipped. The glory of Israel will fly away like a bird. And when I see what Jesus has done to this fig tree, and I see it in the context of these verses from the Old Testament, I I almost see, wow, here's this this fig tree that, that looked like it was fruitful, it had all kinds of fruit, 
And when Jesus got there, there was no fruit at all. And the fruit was supposed to appear on the, the mature branches, the old wood, I guess you'd call it. And there was nothing. And so he did away with it. And then I saw him overturning the tables in the temple. The temple that looked like it had so much fruit, that it should be producing so much closeness to God. And yet all it was producing was commerce. And so he cleansed it. And I see a parallel, and I expect Jesus oh, just to kind of rake the situation that was going on there. And yet what Jesus says, have faith in God. He turns to his disciples, and they're saying, you destroyed this fig tree. Wow, look at that. It withered from the grounds up. What a miracle this is. And Jesus says, have faith in God. And then he goes on to say these words. And these are challenging words. Have faith in God. I tell you the truth. You can say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and it's going to happen. But you must really believe it will happen and have no doubt in your heart. I tell you, you can pray for anything. And if you believe that you've received it, it will be yours. But when you're praying, first forgive anyone you're holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. It was funny as... As we were talking about this, this passage, um, we were with some friends, and, and uh, he shared how when he was a kid, he remembers standing in front of a window and uh, praying that uh, the tree across the yard would move. And he prayed earnestly and prayed earnestly and never moved. And he started questioning. He just read this verse, but he started questioning. Um, let me just say, this is not a, a verse to uh, say how to become a wonder worker. Uh, this is a verse to say how do we have faith in God? How do we have faith in the God who can do wonders? But how do we have faith in Him who we know will do what is best? How do we have faith in God? Um, I've written down here, our faith is not meant to force God to do anything. Let me say that again. Our faith is not meant to force God to do anything. No. Our faith is meant to allow us to surrender to God who can do anything and to trust Him. To trust Him to do what's best. So you may say to me, so what's this bit about the mountain? Telling the mountain to go jump in a lake. Well, let me set the setting. The setting we've been looking at. Jesus coming down the side of the Mount of Olives. Jesus by that fig tree. Jesus looking across the valley toward a mount. And it's called the Temple Mount. Um, Carrie and I had the opportunity of being in the Holy Land last year, uh, two years ago. And we saw this Temple Mount. And, and I can just imagine, it took Herod 40 years to build this temple. And part of the reason was he had to build a mountain to be able to put the temple on. And he had to build a mountain so that he could make those huge courts. And it took years building these reinforcing walls, filling it with dirt and going higher and higher. And then on top, he built the temple. And I see Jesus looking across there. Because look at what Jesus says. You can say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea. I almost hear Jesus saying, you can say to all this religious tradition, you can say to all these rituals and relics, you can say to all these things that you put your hope and your faith in, go jump in a lake. Your faith has to be in God. And when I say that, please don't misunderstand. I'm not doing away with miracles or anything like that. I think we have a wonder-working God, but our faith is in Him, not in our faith producing those things. So just a simple, another little reminder. Remember, our faith is in the only God who can do, and I'd add the word anything. Our faith is only in Him. So we bring this to a close. I see Jesus, yeah, He's had this great reveal. He's set the stage. He says to His Father that the hour has come. The time is now. I go back to that garden where this angel was placed with that sword that flamed that kept people from going back to that tree of life. And ever since that time, 
people in order to come into the presence of God had to basically have something go under that sword. They had to provide some kind of sacrifice so that they could enter into the presence of God somehow, some way. And Jesus knows he's coming to be that final, full sacrifice. He's going to go under that sword for each and every one of us, and he did. He did. And in going under that sword four days from now, being hung up on that cross, going through that excruciating time, separation from God himself, being the Son of God, He made that way open for us to be able to come in to his presence. In fact, I would say he made that way open for us to be able to come to that tree of life. Because we now have eternal life because of Jesus Christ himself. Boy, can you see Jesus, that victorious Messiah, coming down the Mount of Olives on a humble donkey. Coming in with peace, grace. Righteousness, justice, mercy. And he's calling each and every one of us to step into this new life that he has created for us, to be able to bring hope and change into this world, to be able to not fall into the rituals and all the regulations and the hopes of just religious foolishness, but instead to walk a life with him. You know, I would just say in closing, we, we are in some very... Huh. Unique times. I, I can't remember a time in my life when, yeah, we've uh, had to close public places where we're fearful of uh, a virus that could come and we have no idea where it might be. It would be so easy to fall into that fear. But I hear those words of Jesus, have faith in God. And Jesus is saying to each and every one of us today, I've already taken the sword for you. Now bring your stuff to Jesus. Bring your stuff to God himself. And, you know, there's one little thing he adds on the end of there. If you've got any grudge against somebody, ah, forgive him. Forgive him. So that God can forgive you. I, 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 it would be so easy to get all caught up in trying to change systems and to be upset at everything. And yet Jesus said, don't be upset. Try to understand why they've gotten to where they've gotten. Instead, take my grace and my peace with you into this world. I challenge you. Don't live in fear. Live in faith. Live in faith in the amazing God. Live in faith of the full work of Jesus Christ. Live in faith of knowing that the Holy Spirit lives within you. You are his temple. Let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you for this time. And I thank you. Lord, I don't know who's watching this right now, but Father, I just ask how you'd be so real to them. Lord, may we know your strength and your hope and your power. And Father, may we not sink into fear, but help us instead to stand on faith faith in you, the hope of glory. We love you. We love you. We give you this time in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Christ of the Lord, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face, I rest on His unchanging grace. In every heart. Stormy gale, oh, my anchor holds within the veil. Where does it hold? My anchor holds within the veil. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak may strong in the same. in his righteousness alone faultless stand before the throne sing that again when he, he shall come when he shall come with trumpet sound oh may I in him be found dressed in his Here. 